shoulders are sore. I went to the gym for the first time yesterday. Nice. Oh man, I can feel it. <sighs> That's powerful. I've started. Uh, I've started running regularly, which has probably been. Um, I just miss it. I you know, believe it or not, I used to actually enjoy running. Mm. I soccer used to days. literally like soccer days. Um, for those of you who don't know, I played soccer for like six, seven years or something. Sergio was a big part of that. Uh, he used to pick me up from soccer practice occasionally. Dude. That's great. That's remember, re- remember the fields. Yes. Dude. Like behind, blue bird. behind the blue bird. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was bad. Anyways, I used to really enjoy just going out for a run. And now it's not at all enjoyable. It's been pain the last three, four weeks. But I will say uh, this past, uh, this last run that I did felt two times probably better than mm. my last several ones and i it, it feels much better to know i'm not dying after the run uh, it's still bad yeah, yeah. but so totally. good times uh are you running more than once a week or what's you have a routine uh, schedule right now i'm on just once a week oh, but nice. i'm trying to work it up to two times a week it's just hard right. every time i'm like man i'm gonna wake up earlier and run this day something comes up or uh uh, like I'm trying to run on the evenings, but then I'm like, well, I have a podcast this day. We're roasting right. this day. I have to edit this, this, that. It just gets really chaotic. So it's been bad, but I'm trying to, it, it's an essential. It needs to happen. I mean, chain legs loops coming up. That's right. That's right. We're <laughs> if, doing it. If we don't freeze, it's going to be a very a low temp. It's going to go from eighties to 69 for a high uh, for 39. And then 39 at you, night. Is that what you meant? No, no, 80s? the highs. The high. The uh, highs today be... was 83, and this Saturday, it's gonna. the high is going to be 69. What? The high is 69? Oh, that's kind of yeah. breezy. Or, or wow. is that tomorrow? I mean, anyway, the yeah. temperature is fluctuating way too much yeah. to get stuck up in the mountain. For sure. We're taking, uh, we're taking uh, a little backpacking excursion this weekend. Um, my, my video, a short little video might come on the channel. Uh, we'll definitely be brewing up a storm, um, in the middle of two beautiful Pacific Northwest peaks. We're excited for that. Uh, but more to come on that. But yeah, yeah. that being said, um, actually speaking of which, hopefully I can bring the regalia geisha natural that I yeah. up on the mountain. It's powerful. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> folks, we're doing a Q and a session on this episode of the coffee of the Coffee Roaster Warm Up Sessions podcast. I'm excited for it. Q&As are great. They just, um, first off, they make my life easier, our life easier. Yeah. But then also, uh, the best thing about Q&As is that we can actually help people with the questions and the problems that they have. And that is the biggest thing. It's so hard for me to ask, for me to, for us to find these topics, but it's so easy to be able to say, man, the, here's how, here's what we can share about our experience with this specific topic Mm -hmm. but anyways how's the how's the brew basket on this oh i mean it looks super coarse but this tastes nice for a change it it tastes actually dial somewhat dial somewhat yeah (laughs) it tasted good at first and i'm like ah it actually needs to go just a hair finer yeah yeah it's a little Um, prickly it's not (laughs) A little prickly. Eh? Have you guys ever heard of that <laughs> flavor note on a bag? A little prickly you flavor prickly note. Pear. Reminds us of prickly, uh, prickly cactus. <laughs> yes, <totally. laughs> Not like the taste of them, but no, the feel. The feel, <laughs> yeah. Tactile experience. Prickly. We need to we need to put on our bags like flavor. Reminds us of flavor wise. Reminds us of texture wise. Mm. Brushed metal. Hmm. <laughs> 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 It's cooled down. We've been talking for like the last 20 mm-hmm. minutes with it's off the yeah. off the pad. Um, it's nice. Honestly, nice. Um, it's probably been one of the more better batch brews that we brewed over the last um, several podcasts, you know, many I mean, podcasts. I mean, like getting a very clean, clear grapefruit. Ruby red, like grapefruit. You know, I don't think this is the coffee. And, well, even though it may be. Um, I think the batch just is not giving it the clarity that it needs, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, it's a little muddled, yeah. but even though it's muddled, it's got a nice, a nice tactile yeah. mouthfeel 
flavor experience. It's still nice. It's mm-hmm. pleasant. Mm. Some pear, some stone fruit. Mm. It's, a ni- it's a nice coffee. Yeah. This yeah. coffee, it's, it's a, it's a Columbia wash mm-hmm. process coming from Woods Coffee. It's the big, big chain, uh, not, not, not super big chain, but kind of larger, larger, um, chain of cafes. Um, they're a so line, I think oh. slaps from time to time, uh, actually more than time to time, mm-hmm. but, uh, but, uh, yeah, which is, which is kind of cool. So this is a new drop that they had that I noticed. I picked up a bag with my rewards points. It's always <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I love, I love those reward points. Um. So yeah, I think the the flavor notes on the bag are tropical fruit, cacao, yep. and uh, florals. Yep. So, um, I was getting when I walked in, they actually asked me um, the baristas last time I walked in. We're like, hey, can you do some QC on this? I'm like, give me a minute, hold up, let me get my pal- tasting palette out. <laughs> and their batch was actually really, really tasty. It was probably mm. I think actually better than this, um, but I was getting a lot more of that stone fruit. Yeah. fruit uh fruit and florals with some nice acidity um, yeah so yeah maybe this is slightly under extracted that's why i'm like tasting like a mm-hmm. sweet grapefruit like a ruby red grapefruit so that could be that could be it overall really pleasing actually yeah um not super dialed but overall yeah. uh kind of a pleasing experience um that being said uh we're doing a q and a session um and the first question which makes sense to ask comes from our uh friend alex roses i think if i pronounce that right alex says will you ever be happy with your batch brew before the episode (laughs) probably not i mean it's like we're always drinking different coffees we never write down our grind sizes um we kind of guess out of 12 12 is like a go-to on uh, the we EK. do, yeah, on the EK, on our EK, it's uh, Burr's touch out one, right? A zero. A zero? Oh, this EK has a zero setting. For Forget. espresso. This is the new EK. Yeah, this is the new EK. Forget. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a 12 seems to be nice, kind of hits the spot, but we're not brewing the same coffees, rarely. rarely. Yeah, yeah, rarely. Yeah. So And different, all kinds of different freshness dates, which yeah, throws yeah, a yeah. wrench in there. For sure. Yeah. Um, other it's, than that, we keep everything the same. 50 in usually, yeah. 800, water. 1 to 16, yeah. classic. Classic. Um, but honestly, we could probably enjoy this if we just tracked our our notes yeah. um, with grind size-wise. But um, that's the hard thing with just doing one-off brews with the batch brew. Is if you're if you're brewing, you know, once, yeah. to, you know, you wake up the next morning, you can usually adjust your grind size accordingly and nail it. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, so Alex, to be honest, I have low hopes for us ever yeah. enjoying a batch brew on the podcast. Yeah. But that all being said, um, it's all part of the game. It's all exactly. <laughs> it's all part of the game. It's part of the episode. And yeah. uh, honestly, I wouldn't want to start any podcast with anything other than undialed batch brew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Undialed batch brew it is then. Yeah. So. Thanks so much, Alex, for asking that. That's beautiful. Um, next, we're just going to bust these out because there's a, a handful of them uh, here, and we may not be able to get to all of them by the time we get through mm. this. So uh, question number two, how do you go from buying green coffee from mm. a big importer to buying direct from producers? Whew. Can I answer a question with a que- question? Oh, those are the worst, but fine. My question is why? Oh. Mm-hmm. What's the problem with the mm-hmm. uh, importing company? It's and very the, good that's question. why, because there's no, I'm not saying that, yeah, I'm not making a statement here uh, that can be answered. There could be a right answer from both angles, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think my main thought behind this is remember we did that webinar in 2020 with Red Fox, yeah. importing company, mm-hmm. and they talked about basically, um, the whole chain of production from the farm when the cherries get picked to when coffee arrives at your roastery and how complicated that is. With that information, my first thought is, 
why would I want the farmer to take care of all of that or the producer to take care of all of that? That's well, a lot of work. On, on the flip side, it's not just the producer, but why would you want to take care of that? Right. Listen, as, yes. a, that's, as, that's as a business owner, as somebody who's running either a cafe or a roastery or both put together, you have plenty of stuff to take care of. Like yeah. a lot of people ask us like, hey, when are you going to start a coffee shop? Honestly, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it every day. I'm not dreaming about it. Why? Is because we have so much work that we want to do mm -hmm. just from the roasting and the sourcing side that throwing a cafe in there is just another wrench. It's just another big headache mm -hmm. in what we want to accomplish. That may yeah. not be for everybody. But the point of that is to say when you're taking on, um, if you're cutting out a big importer, that importer is realistically speaking, they're not just sitting around and not doing anything and right. just upcharging you and making money off you yeah. that's not the case yeah they're dealing with paperwork with logistics customs uh containers all this stuff yep that if they don't do it you have to do yeah. it and that the, and there's yeah. there's a cost to that and but at the same time like everything in business supply chains is that if you can actually increase your production and um, there, this is a very rude way of saying it, but I just don't know how else to say it, but to cut some, cut a portion out to yeah. take more, have more leverage in the supply right. chain, more kudos to you. But what I would say is you actually have to be pretty big for that to be a good business yes. move and a very strategic, um, strategic business move with upsides for your business. Right. There are producers and farmers who do have importing companies. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with a few farmers who like exclusively work with certain other partners. But the re reality is when coffee comes off a tree or a processing mill, it needs to go through certain logistics to get to uh, yes. on a ship and to your roastery. Mm -hmm. And sometimes not everything can be covered by just one person you need to work so teamwork is important so you need to work in the team is what i'm saying and a couple more because we have to just rip through this uh we should just do a whole podcast on why you should or shouldn't do that uh number one uh, this is coming from the dear green coffee buyer book with mm. by ryan brown which if you haven't if you ask this question and you haven't read it read it please but he says in there that most places where people are talking about direct trade fair trade they're not doing they're actually not doing it on their own it's right. just the label yep like that that's just the reality of in, of the industry it's actually changing becoming more popular to go direct Mm -hmm. But when we're saying, when I'm saying more popular, literally it's just a couple more <laughs> roasters yeah. that are, that yeah. are starting okay. to pull that off. So that's something to consider. Um, but how do you go from buying green coffee from a big importer to buying direct from a producer? Number one, uh, I'm just going to give it to you. Uh, do a lot of logistical research, figure out what it takes yep. to ship, to import, to export, uh, finding an exporter, um, Maybe you want to work through somebody. So yep. finding an exporter and finding an importer to import it for you. Uh, uh, do some research into shipping, organizing shipping. Yep. Uh, the other thing is you need to do an origin trip. Find a producer you want to partner with and build a relationship with. Build some kind of uh, connection with them where you feel safe doing business with them and mm -hmm. they feel safe doing business with you. Um, really network a lot do a lot of research expect failure but uh and then also build a lot of relationships yep. with uh at origin that's, that's if you if that's what yep. you want to do then that's yep that's it that's solid uh also i'm just gonna throw this in it's be also becoming slightly popular for producers to start exporting their coffee themselves yep for example like like uh um people like virgil um like uh Sicilo probably be something like that. Yeah. Out of I mean, Indo, kind of. Kind of. Well, they're still going yeah, through. Yeah, they're still Bright going Java. through. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's becoming slightly more popular, but yeah. for for a producer to do that, it costs a lot of money. Yeah. Like, so anyways, it's it's a lot more complicated. Yeah. Now. Last, yeah. last thoughts? No, no that, that's great. I don't want to really add anything. Infrastructure is tough. So, yeah. yeah. All righty. So Nick asks, could you learn roasting with YouTube? Ikawa sample, 
Uh, could you learn roasting with YouTube, Ikawa Sampler Roaster, and Rails Books? Uh, everything's possible. Of course you can. Uh, I think uh, that would be a good place to start. Uh, I started with Rails Book. You remember when I bought, um, uh, what was it? His very first roasting book at Match Sticks with you when we visited that one Coffee time. Coffee Roaster Companion. Yeah, that one. Um so yeah, that book really kind of changed my perspective because mm -hmm. I originally started roasting through SCA training and that was what got me started. And then his book challenged a few of my perspectives mm -hmm. and got me thinking, which is a good place to be. And then mm -hmm. at the same time, I started also doing a lot of research online and picking mm -hmm. up different blogs, reading different material and getting challenged by different views and perspectives on roasting. So I think that that's a good place to start I, I, it's hard for me to say that without like proper, maybe, um, mentorship or proper, uh, training, like sitting under a roaster, you will be able to execute everything as well as you'd like to, at least for us. I feel like we've just gotten so much hands-on experience from our previous jobs, but also from talking mm -hmm. to Scott a lot and having that direct connection with him has really helped us um, roast to the best of our ability where we're at. So I think that that's a good place to start, but there's usually more. Yeah. Unfortunately, could you start learning roasting with YouTube? There's not very much information on YouTube. That's yeah. the reality of it. You have like the Mill City guys that are teaching. You have um, uh, Cafe Imports that does mm -hmm. some lessons on their Cropster, but it's very, very minimal. Uh, and there's a lot of really bad, uh, I'm just going to be honest, there's a lot of really bad roasting advice out there. <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt. But um, yes, read, watch YouTube, uh, use an Ikawa sample roaster, and read a lot of Scott Rayo's books. And follow him, follow Scott Rayo on Instagram. He's dropping some really great facts and information on there. It's free, no... You don't have to pay for it. It's and it's stuff that even you and I were just talking about it before right. the podcast. Totally. Stuff that I'm like, yes, like we were just thinking about yep. this. And so he's dropping a lot of information. One thing, one caveat, Ikawa Sample Roaster is probably not the best machine to learn on. Yeah. If you want to learn with a small setup, I would recommend you to save up some money and maybe buy a bullet roaster. Yeah. Well, actually, if you're if you have enough money for a sample roaster <laughs> like the Ikawa, you should be able to afford a bullet. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a new machine that's coming that's has a lot of updates called Roast or R O E S T, which might be more helpful. But then on top of that, you have stuff like I would honestly recommend you to pick up uh, like a Mill City uh, yeah. 500 gram roaster or a 1 kg, yeah. like as small as you can to keep costs down. Um, the Ikawa is just not super great for learning. Yeah. Uh, that's just the reality. It's, it's a sample roaster. It's not a roaster <laughs> learning. Yeah. So it's basically an automated machine for the most part. Yeah. Um, and there's and lacking a, sensors and yeah, all kinds sure. of control. And it's not a drum roaster. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of the things that you may learn from the Ikawa, you won't really be able to transfer to like a production roast. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I started on the ARC sample roasters. That's yeah. what I dialed in coffees on that and then transferred that to a bigger um, roaster. So, that's, yeah, I'm right on. I would recommend the same. And on top of that, honestly, Sergio already mentioned it, but hands-on experience, roast, 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 roast a yeah. freaking thousand pat batches. Yeah. It's roast and cup like it's like your life depends on it <laughs> yeah seriously Alrighty. so uh man these are all such great questions and there's a lot of them uh let's, let's try not to take too long mm -hmm. uh it's hard scaling the biz wholesale mm -hmm. b2b versus b2c perspective uh this is a tough one this just this requires a whole episode of its own yeah. specifically for roasters in the industry um b2b versus b2c perspective i'm just gonna drop a couple things yep. um that they're more my ideologies and thought process and how i approach business but um number one networking uh in business as contrary to popular opinion just being a really good person really kind outgoing 
just a good person yeah. and wanting to care and serve people gets you really far. Mm-hmm. Number two, I would say is um, building a brain and using social media. It's an absolute must. Uh, the fact that like you know about us, we're just some roaster in a small town in Washington. Why do you know about us? Because you've probably been exposed to us on social media, through this podcast, on YouTube. Yep. Utilize these avenues to grow, to expand uh, your reach. Your yeah. reach. At the end of the day, listen, this is a perspective that I always think about. Is that imagine if you had every person in the United States, which is about 320 million people, hear about your coffee roasting business. B2C and B2B, both. Right. Imagine if 0.001% mm-hmm. bought a bag from you out of 320 million. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it would be excellent. <laughs> I remember having those conversations Yeah, in the early days. And for sure. I still think that way. Yeah. Because the reality is there's somebody out there that wants to buy a bag of mirror coffee mm-hmm. that just... They can't because they have no idea we even exist. Yep. That's the reality, and that's a difficulty for all small businesses. Yeah. Um, and that's going to help a lot for B2C and B2B. Yeah. Um, but uh, B2C, yeah, just utilize the heck out of social media. You have to learn. But also, these are some difficult things. You will have to invest money to grow B2C online. You yeah. just will. Hire a web developer, hire a marketing team, an agency to run some ads for you, whatever it is. It's stuff that not many roasters think of including in your startup costs as a roastery, yep. but they're absolutely necessary because the rest of the world does it. Just coffee roasting companies don't, Yeah, <laughs> but everybody else does. So that's my take. Serge, as a, as a manager um, of a cafe, you kind of work in that B2B, yeah. B2C uh, or sorry, B two B. Both, yeah. Um, yeah, and B two C. Yep. Give us your give us your take on that. The first thing that comes to my mind is when we started Mirror, mm-hmm. we started it during a pandemic, so we had to focus on B two C. That was initially, and I think that's part of uh, just part of our journey, but also part of our quote unquote success and how we've been able to maintain this business for the last couple of years, few years, Mm -hmm. you know, is because of that. We had nothing but one focus, B2C, and we went on Instagram Lives. We connected Mm -hmm. with people. Everything you're saying is what we did. And that actually expanded one, our reach and connected us with other businesses. So my question is approach both B2B and B2C with the mindset of like, what are these people looking for? That's that's mm-hmm. the key. Because they're not, B2B and B2C are not much different. There's just different desires. But at the end of the day, they're looking for something and you're helping fill, fill that void. So from that mentality of like servanthood. So I know from the fact during COVID, uh, d- during the initial lockdowns, mm-hmm. folks were looking for a coffee experience at home. So B2C made sense. When things started to open up, because we expanded our reach one-on-one, we were able to contact businesses. But at the end of the day, it was the same thing, whether we're talking to a business owner or someone who's brewing at home. Mm-hmm. There's slight, of course, I'm blanket statementing a mm-hmm. lot of these things. There's slight tweaks to that, but the similarities are 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 there. For example, where do people, the question is, where do people meet? If you're looking for like more B2B, where can you target like groups of people and mm-hmm. gatherings of people? That's a that's a big thought process for me. Is like, okay, how can I how can I find connection points where there's yeah. a bigger reach when I contact or talk to someone, I have a bigger reach all at once. So you're utilizing your time well. Mm-hmm. And then just focus and grow on that as connecting yeah. with people. You have to be you have to get really creative. Yeah. Um B2B has its own challenges and B2C have, have its own challenges. Right. Um, and actually what we said just right now is like really edgy information that not everybody would probably agree on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I literally heard Gary V talk about it earlier today on a podcast is that B2C and B2B um, right now in the big business world, they're approached differently in how you brand and market. But she was talking with some other CMOs and stuff, how mm-hmm. they're actually realizing that you actually should be marketing in a very si- almost similar yeah. fashion. 
Um, so anyways, that's a yeah. tangent, but, um, a lot of research think, and, uh, like, I like that you said that look at where people are gathering, find unconventional ways where you sell coffee. Yeah. I'm telling you, there are so many right now with coffee becoming such a big cultural thing. Trust me. There are so many places that coffee roasters are not going into. Mm-hmm. Because that's not where their mind goes, and they think we need to sell to cafes and restaurants and yeah, hotels. Exactly. Yep. There are so many other places yep. where people are wanting to buy coffee, but nobody is really reaching out to those places. There, it exists. Yep, for sure. <laughs> so get creative. Anyways, wow. All right, 25 minutes. Uh, we're already short on time, <laughs> and we're only three questions in, four questions in. All right. Uh, what are the qualities of a good coffee shop manager? And the same person also asked, what are some fun things you can put into place to provide a fun work environment at a shop? Sergi, zoom through this. I think you have a better perspective than I do at this. Can you say the second one again? What are some things you can put into place to provide a fun work environment at a shop? Mm. Okay. So one, I'll, I just want to give a big shout out to uh, Lisa Farr and Matt Forward. I actually did a whole series on this topic. So that's nice. one thing. But to give you a little, um, because this is only, I'm only answering a question for a few minutes. Main thing for a cafe manager is understanding the vision of the business they're working for. Because for the most part, the cafe manager is playing the middle ground between a team of employees and the owner. And their job is to support the team employees, but also understand what the owner is desiring. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to grasp the vision and then model it, communicate it, and execute it daily. So presence is important. I'd say listen and being able to listen to what both parties want is important. To be able to um, negotiate is important. All of those things are valuable. And then also the classic, if you're a cafe manager, don't get upset when you have to do things like take out the trash, plunge a toilet, all of the you know day-to-day -day hard work because you're going to have to do that. And that's the reality of it all. But your primary job is to carry the vision and communicate the vision to the team. So I think that's important. But then to keep a fun environment, there's little things that you can do. Um, one, one thing is I love when baristas have their go-to playlists um, behind bar. Like when whoever's on Ox or depends on whether that's the bar person or the host person and they get to turn out turn a, on something unique to them, that is excellent. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it, people are fun. You know what I mean? Your yeah. team should be able to connect with one another and have a fun vibe behind bar. Like talking, like uh, today it was me and uh one other barista emily on bar and then the kitchen folks jumped up and we just literally just talked about movies what that did was it actually guests overheard they joined in the conversation and we were literally talking about movies with like other guests and like the whole community yeah. just discussing that is a team that loves like to talk to connect to one another they're gonna invite the community into that and that is key that is so important i would say cool um just gonna chime in one thing what are some good qualities of a good coffee shop manager listen uh i'm mean, just gonna quote the title of the book by simon sinek leaders eat last that's a good one uh, Luke Muss or Luke, Luke Muse, not quite sure, but uh, two questions. Mice 2022, not really <laughs> sure what that means. Uh, give me some clarity. Um, and then you asked, um, how do you keep yourself from burning out when you mm. are a barista all week and a roaster? Mm. Oh, man, this might be edgy and controversial. Like, because I one time a mentor of mine told me, that um, that burnout doesn't have to happen. That's you, you have an option. You have a choice to burn out or not. And by that, he meant the fact that you can work 70, 80 hours a week and not burn out. You can also work 20 hours a week and burn out. So mm -hmm. it really has to do with like being self-aware and understanding your needs and what you can what you can handle. So for me personally, like yeah, it gets like hours wise, it gets tricky. I also have a young child. All of that does get tricky. 
But some of the things that Mark, you and I have been talking about that's been helping me is categorizing my time and knowing like how effective I can be within certain elements. Therefore, I'm freeing up brain space right Mm -hmm. here. And I'm not burning out because I know that, okay, right now for this period of time, I need to take care of this. And I'm just going to focus on that. When my mind starts focusing on like a million different things, like, you know, Mm -hmm. what's going to happen at narrative? Like, are we going to have this or that? Like, is Mir going to drop their new bag soon? Like when I'm thinking about everything all at once, that gets overwhelming. So I I don't think you have to really worry about quote unquote burnout. You just have to focus on what's in front of you and what what you're working on presently. And then remember that the key is for every yes, you have to realize that you're automatically saying no to. We do have a limiting factor and that limiting factor is time, but that doesn't mean you can't achieve a lot within a little bit of time. Everybody has, to be honest, everybody has 24 hours. Right. Time is, uh, time is, um, I, I once used it as an excuse and now I'm like, nope, that's yeah definitely not an excuse. Not where I'm at right now in my life. Yeah. And I've realized the more organized you get, the more efficient that you get, the more you start to write things down and create things that actually help you. And also, I mean, I think for me, um, loving what I'm doing helps so much. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now if I hated one of my jobs yeah. or something that I'm doing and I have to do it for a long period of time. That would yeah. just suck. But the fact that I love it, sometimes I'm like sample roasting at like 10, 11 p.m. at midnight. Yeah. I'm just sample roasting. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, actually, this is counting towards my my work hours. Yeah. Wow. You know, and I'm just, I'm just literally, I'm just yeah. really enjoying it. And also, uh, you know, the reality is spend less time on social media, mm-hmm. uh, spend less time, you know, binging TV shows, spend less time. Um, maybe you need to spend less time eating junk food. Maybe you mm-hmm. need to add a workout in there. Maybe you need to add a walk in there. Maybe you need to read more books. It's stuff like that, that I think for me, The more that I spend time on social media, even though it's a big part of my job, but Mm -hmm. the more that I do, it actually starts taking away from my clarity, my thought process, my capacity. And the less time that I'm spending on it, the more I feel clear and just so on point. I can just handle so much. So, you know, every yes is a no and make sure that everything you're saying yes to in your day to day life is yeah. actually adding to your life and not taking away. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, I don't know. just, this is such a good question and yeah. an important one to, um, because I think for a lot of portion of my life, I was using a burnout as um, almost as an excuse. Or um, if I was approached with a challenge, I would use like, oh, I'm burning out kind of thing, like because I can't handle it. Um, like that doesn't have to be your reality. That doesn't have to be the truth that you live by. So I would say one, find ways that you can actively rest instead Mm -hmm. of, um, looking at rest to be passive or like, Hey, I'm going to rest. I'm going to go to sleep. Like that's not necessarily rest. That's like maybe your body physically is recovering, Mm -hmm. but find things that actually like open up your mind to new opportunities that give you joy, that give you energy, Mm -hmm. find those things that is rest. So again, like you brought up like a binge watching on Netflix, maybe you can binge watch a show once a month, but you don't have to do that every day. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's a time and place, like we all like a little piece of dessert, like donuts are great. I love donuts. But if donuts become a staple to my diet, that's not going to do me good. For sure. Yeah. I th- and man, this just, this needs to be a whole episode as well. But um, these things also uh, know, just know who you are, know yeah. your personal limits. What, what I can do might not be what Sergi can do and what we can do might not mm-hmm. be what you can do. <laughs> just because we're doing it or somebody else is doing it, it doesn't mean that you can do it or you should do it. Yeah. You know, like, this isn't just because you know yeah i i i mean the weird stuff like for me personally like if i like i've i've been waking up earlier in the day and i've kind of trying to dial in my sleep schedule even though i've been waking up earlier i've never felt more rested and Mm -hmm. energized right and that's a weird kind of thing it almost feels 
counterintuitive. Yeah. So these things work for us. May, they may not work for you, but figure that out for yourself. And it's a journey. You burn out once, don't get mad at yourself. You get up and you yeah. figure out, you can reevaluate what just went wrong and you fix it and you go along the way. That's it, you know? Yeah. Like don't beat yourself up for and one step at a time. Yeah. And I just want to clarify one thing. Like when I said that um, the whole burnout being a reality and stuff, I'm not dismissing the idea of burnout. Yeah. Burnout is a real thing. For sure. People do burn out. I've burned out before. Mm -hmm. 100% real thing. But burnout doesn't have to be like if you work 41 hours, you're burning out. Yeah. Yeah. See what I mean? Exactly. Because I think the danger is you can burn out on 20 hours of work a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. I mean, there's so much that I'm like... Ah, okay. Anyways, um, so two questions by the same person again. Uh, Want to start roasting business in the future mm. while working as a full-time barista? How should I start? <laughs> this is pretty much the same question, uh, kind of to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, but how should I start? Well, uh, a I don't know. Try to try to find a roaster that you can shadow, that you can mm -hmm. kind of look over. Maybe get a side job uh, at a roasting company or um start reading books start reading into resources listening to podcast episodes start just learning about roasting yeah. um and for sure like we always say get a job at a roastery that would be the biggest win not yeah. everybody can but that can be that's a that's a massive resource that i would recommend yeah. two easy examples for like you and i we know these people are micah and alana yeah. uh micah story kind of goes started as a barista worked a couple of jobs as a barista and then realized, Hey, like I would love to see how roasting goes mm -hmm. and ended up finding a local roast roaster and connecting with them and now works for them and works in the cafe. Mm -hmm. So I would just wait. Like one of the things is like, be patient, like just st stick to your job and see what's there. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and wait, because Alana's story is she started working at uh, Makeworth started yeah. just as a barista i remember when i trained her and then who would have known that she would end up to be the production roaster right yeah. now at makeworth would have never known but makeworth ended up start starting to roast yeah. she was available she's already created that um uh, like credibility yeah. for the company you know and now she's roasting and for sure having a blast so and that. if you want some really practical stuff start saving up some money yeah saving up money is always a good idea uh, and yeah. whether that's you're still going to need it to start a roastery a business or you save up enough money to buy yourself a small like we were talking about a little bullet roaster or right. like a 1 kg or a 500 gram machine start roasting hands on totally. and just go for it so um second question batch brew or a hand brew from guest and cafe perspective well, this that's is a, a big whole one. episode this is yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this needs yeah. to be a whole episode. But in a nutshell, yeah, I think I love batch brew from a guest perspective because I work. I'm mostly a guest at cafes. It's quick. It's um, it's great if I'm like on the go, on mm -hmm. the run. Um, it's usually more affordable. Uh, and um, the downside of that though is that it's usually not dialed. <laughs> batch brew yeah. usually doesn't taste really great. Um, so as good as a, as a hand brew. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, shoot. So many ways I can also take this. I think like hand brews are great for a cafe mm -hmm. um, because it reveals the coffee, kind of reveals your craft in a very practical way. And I feel like pour overs are a little more approachable than drinking a shot of espresso. Yeah. So I would say yeah. it kind of plays that middle ground between just a, you know, house drip, whatever yeah, that is yeah, yeah. Uh, to a, like a shot of espresso, you move on to maybe a black pour over because there's more sweetness, more nuance. You might get surprised by different flavor notes. Um, so there's that element. Um, also it depends on from a cafe perspective, like what coffees are you serving? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a cafe that is serving a lot of blends, um, then maybe a hand brew is not the best way to represent the coffee. Yes. I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm saying that as a blanket statement or an assumption. Or on right? the flip side is if you're serving a lot of blends on espresso and batch right. 
a hand brew is next to him way to let a, a Nesso shine on right. its own. So. Exactly. Yeah. So it depends on your like just coffee menu at the cafe. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that comes to my mind is a hand brew allows for you to um, serve specific coffees and maybe educate um, the consumer base. Like mm-hmm. for example, when we're uh, serving a Gesha at Narrative, a lot of the times we'll brew just one batch or one pour over yeah. and share it with our guests as right. like quote unquote samples, but also to introduce people to like, Hey, this is the difference between a batch brew and a pour over that's a great and idea. that kind of nuance. Like, Hey, what are you tasting here? Yeah. That's, so. that's spectacular. Um, we'll definitely do a whole episode on that. Cause I think there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, last, Lastly, from Michael, it says, uh, do you see any creative similarities between your work in coffee and media work? Um, yeah, yes and no, I guess. <laughs> um, I think it's very different. Mm-hmm. Um, you're working with something digital, something visual. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very, um, yeah, it's, it's, more like a visual experience that you have to make look good and um all that stuff and then coffee is more uh like a flavor experience it's a completely different experience like what flavor versus you know uh like a like a flavor experience versus a visual experience right um the stuff that goes into them is very different however similarities uh i i think the biggest thing that I would say is it, they both require you to know who you are, know what you want and really to dig deep into yourself Mm -hmm. and figure out how do I bring this to life? That I think is the same in both for us on the coffee side. It's like, these are the flavor profiles that we like, or we buy really great coffee. How do we make this coffee shine? How do we, you know, take out the most out of this coffee and same with my creative work. Mm-hmm. I have a vision in mind, whether it's whether a client hires me, whether I'm doing it for Mir, or whether I'm doing it just for myself. I have some kind of vision in mind, a story that I want to tell or yep. something. And the idea is how do I use the tools at hand to m- make that come to be? Yep. And in reality, the creative process in both is that there's infinite. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Infinite um, variables and ways to do it and that's what actually is making it both challenging exciting kind of interesting um and there's there's failure along the way both so yeah i don't know i mean a, a lot of it i think uh, i'm looking over uh trey and daniela's wedding photos right now the stills and it makes me think of kind of like the cupping process and in coffee as well so i feel like there's a lot of similarities in that sense um, may not be like practical similarities but i'm thinking like even like i mean like composure when you're putting together a shot when you're Mm -hmm. thinking it through similar to um when you're dialing in a roast at least to me like i feel like there's a connection between those two in my mind but i think the reality is like you, you said it well you're still utilizing different elements to create an experience um they're just different experiences a visual and a tasting one and then at the end of the day what you're doing is you're problem solving so that that that's a big similarity between how you're thinking through your timeline you're preparing for Mm -hmm. a shoot versus um how you're preparing for a roast and to drop a new product so there's those kind of similarities um but they are pretty different so it's two different experiences very different experiences from a creative perspective they're kind of tackling your different senses yeah. and i think the creative experience is all about tackling the senses you know mm-hmm. your taste feel or taste touch um smell smell um visuals taste touch C. smell c i yeah. yeah um but anyways those yeah. i need to i need to refresh myself with those uh, <laughs> um but yeah. they're tackling different senses but the same experience the same thing still lies is like how do you create a powerful experience Mm -hmm. um through those senses that is intriguing to somebody that is um 
mesmerizing that yeah. is excellent that is uh creative with you know trying not to use that word but creative yeah. you know so it's uh they have some similarities they have a lot of differences but then also i mean look back to the last episode that Just we did about say. experiences mm-hmm. is they also have a lot of similarities in the sense of now the coffee experience is a lot less well not just coffee flavor mm-hmm. but now it's the bag design which is very creative it's the the social media posts it's the the videos the mm-hmm. photos it's all this stuff that makes that has made the the coffee industry so interesting actually yeah. over the years so yeah totally that's great i agree folks uh wow what a long episode but if you've made it this far um thank you so much for listening um i think this was awesome solid mm-hmm. hopefully you who ask questions hopefully you guys got some value in your answers uh, your questions answered that is uh thank you so much for listening friends um and any parting words serge well folks you know it remember reflect what's good <laughs>